It's This Week in Creationism, episode number 67. I'm your host, Joel Duff, and here we take a look at the headlines in the world of young earth creationism over the past couple weeks. First up, we have Bodhi Hodge leaving Answers in Genesis. Yes, that's a big name in Answers in Genesis, and he is left to strike it out on his own. We'll talk a little bit about that. I also want to talk about the Creation Research Society, which held their annual meeting at the Ark Encounter this past week. Then we'll dive into a couple science stories, including talking about golden plovers, um, love plovers, talk about intelligent design and wing flapping. We've got that and a bunch of other stories coming up next. So first up, we have to talk about what's happening at Answers in Genesis. For a number of years, that's been in the works. It's been known that Ken Ham was going to turn over the turn over the reins at some point to some successor. There's been a lot of speculation about who that would be. And of course, that person now we know is Martin Isles, who is a fellow Australian that Ken Ham has brought here to Kentucky to take on and continue his legacy. Martin Isles is kind of, I'll say, kind of easing into it, I guess. I mean, he's doing a couple of videos here and there, and he's given a couple of conferences. Um, but, you know, I'm sure behind the scenes, he's he's working his way into making, um, making the place a little bit more his. But it's not very visible at this time. But what is visible is a change in the employee status of some individuals at the at Answers in Genesis. There's going to be some turnover. That's natural for any kind of large regime change. Um, and again, yeah, regime change is a little strong because Ken Ham feels like he's found a successor that will be very much like himself and follow in his footsteps. But that doesn't mean that everybody's going to feel comfortable with that sort of change in leadership style. And we don't know why, you know, some people have left, but there certainly has been some exodus of individuals, either because, um, for one thing, they're not using as many speakers as they did before. They're not doing as much outreach. And I've talked about this in the past, how they're not doing as much grassroots sort of going out to churches, having being in conferences and so forth. And so they don't have as need, they don't have the need for those speakers that they're sending out across North America. So they've really cut back on those uh, those um, those individuals that are doing that work, they do do a lot of talks at the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum. It's kind of like, you know, come here, you know, pay your money, pay money to come see us and then we'll provide the speakers in, in our own venue, which is a little easier for them. Um, but so there's been a, a few uh, a few folks that have left, but the most notable name um, to have um I guess we'll call it left the ministry uh, is uh, Bodhi Hutch. And uh, Bodhi is uh, Ken Ham's son in law. And he has been, for a number of years, been the executive CEO. I believe that's the right title. He's basically uh, in charge of day to day operations. I mean, Ken Ham hasn't been in charge of sort of the daily, you know, activities at Answers in Genesis for quite a while. He's sort of the figurehead uh, leader um, of. Answers in Genesis. So Bodhi's been the one that's literally been kind of running the place. And all of a sudden in, well, as, as we see here, March of 2024, uh, we have on the Answers in Genesis website saying that Bodhi went full-time with Biblical Authority Ministries and is no longer with Answers in Genesis. That's kind of the word we have. I don't remember any departing article or I mean I might have missed it but I don't remember any fanfare about his going it's simply just an announcement he's no longer here at answers in Genesis um, quick fun fact Bodhi uh, got his master's degree in mechanical engineering from Southern Illinois University in I believe it was 1999 uh, and this is right around the same time I was at the you know Southern Illinois University um, I did my postdoc uh, uh, studies there. And I'm a little surprised we never crossed paths, at least not that I remember. I mean, this would have been well before he was ever at Answers in Genesis. But nonetheless, we're both, you know, Salukis in a way. Um, yeah, Bodhi wrote many, many articles, uh, participated in many book writing um, 
uh, adventures at Answers in Genesis. And, and, and I honestly was very surprised to hear this news that he's no longer affiliated with the Answers in, with Answers in Genesis, especially given his familial status, all right, uh, in terms of the, the, the Ham family. Uh, so what is he doing now? He has begun, now this, he didn't begin this in March, he's had this running blog for a little while, uh, at least a year. And so I don't know if that's because he had been thinking that this might happen, but you know, it, it's sort of a, a side hustle he has going on. Sorry, hustle, bad word. He's not really raising any funds for this that I can see at all, right? This is a, a side interest that he's had for uh, for some time. Biblical Authority Ministries. Of course, that very much matches the message uh, from Answers in Genesis about the, relying on the authority of scriptures. Uh, and so he has a lot of his articles here, and he has lots of links back to Answers in Genesis and things he's written for them. But lately he's been, you know, been doing his own blog post. This is basically a, a, a blogger site. Um, it's really you know, I, it's hard to even subscribe to. Uh, it's there's no call for um, you know support. Uh, it's very very simple, uh, and so I really I I'm still a little bit mystified. Um, I'm glad to see he's got a new hairdo. That's great. Hey, uh, Bodie, we're, we're we're looking at you more similar all the time. You just need to get a pair of glasses. Um, and you know, so I mean, this is from July of just a few weeks ago in 2024. So why leave it this time? I think the the thing that I think most people would look at first would be say like, well, you know, some kind of personal conflict with Martin Isles, a difference of opinion, a new direction. You know, you know, all those things that uh, they say uh, when people leave organizations. It's natural for. Um, leadership to have change over when you have a person at the top that uh, changes over. Personally, I think that um, Bodhi Hoge also has a number of theological distinctives, not that they're distinctive in terms of, I mean, his abiding by the their basic statement of faith, but some eschatological, uh, his presuppositional viewpoint, his, um, uh, there's a few things that I'm aware of that he's, um, He's sort of, I'll say, a little bit different than some of the other uh, folks at Answers in Genesis. Different in my mind, in a good way, but I, I don't want to go into the details on that. <laughs> so, um, but I just, I just find it in, intriguing um, that the the nature of uh, this new ministry of his. Anyway, that's I think notable news because. Bodhi has played a significant role at Answers in Genesis and is clearly no longer involved in that I can see in any way in the Answers in Genesis ministry. I don't think this will be the first sort of relatively big name, you know, to uh, depart from Answers in Genesis during this next year, which I think will be uh, a somewhat turbulent time of sort of reshaping and shifting uh, the ministry. All right, what do we got up next? Well, at the Ark Encounter, which is an Answers in Genesis ministry, they hosted the recent Creation Research uh, Society annual meeting. So the Creation Research Society is a is a gathering uh, or a, a, a group of uh, scholarly young earth creationists who join this society. They have a publication um, which is a, it's a quarterly publication where they publish research. And I would say that of all the Young Earth Creationist journals, it's probably the, the highest quality journal. Take what you will in terms of the meaning of quality. I'm just saying, relatively speaking, the, uh, the Creation Research Society journal has some of the, the better, more in-depth articles um, that you will find in Young Earth Creationism. Unfortunately, they're also behind a paywall uh, I have in the past paid for uh, my membership of the Creation Research Society in order to get the journal. Uh, and I do have large numbers of back issues of the journal via gifts from various individuals, and I've collected a lot of them, but I don't have access to the most recent ones, which is sometimes kind of, uh, kind of frustrating uh, not to be able to access that. Uh, but anyway... Creation Research Society met at Answers in Genesis. They talked about how this is, well, I, I saw on Facebook that several people thought it was one of the bigger meetings that, that they've had. 
Now, I thought it'd be worth spending just a couple minutes going over the conference schedule uh, for this. To just give you an idea of who talks at these conferences and what the types of talks were about. And I have a few comments to say, uh, comments about these. Uh, so we have, here's the conference information. Um, and what we're most interested in is, here's the schedule. All right, and so we had, it was basically two full days of talks uh, and one after another in one room. So this isn't concurrent sessions or anything like that. So everybody's hearing all of these different talks and they're relatively long talks as scientific meetings go. I mean, you're getting, you're getting a good, you know, 30 minutes, sometimes 45 minutes uh, for a, for these talks. So these are not your, you know, um, you know, short student talks like you might have at a large scientific meeting. Um, these are ones that abstracts were submitted and accepted for this and they were chosen. I don't really know how many like abstracts they get or how many they actually deny, you know, whether they're say how much, what the vetting process is like in this particular meeting. Um, but here we have the list of speakers. So now if you're not familiar at all with young earth creationism, you're, you're not really gonna know who these speakers are. If you are familiar with young earth creationism, I think a few things will stick out as I go down this list. Um, we've got um, Hannah Klein, all right? I want to say that she is um, interested in astronomy. is a uh, has been a is a student. Uh, I think she's been undergraduate. I can't remember if she's graduated or not. Uh, and she is one of what I have. Hmm, yeah. I'm gonna label here now, so um, I apologize to Hannah if you didn't, if you, if you weren't, if you didn't want to be lumped in with this group and write me and tell me that uh, you disagree. But she uh, helps on the New Creation blog, uh, along with a number of other uh, students who write on this Young Earth Creationist blog, and I have labeled them or called them in the past like the New Creationist. Right? I have this whole series on the New Creationism, sort of the new. Uh, apologetic method, a new way of approaching young earth creationism, or at least in terms of outreach and how they go about doing their science and their communication. Uh, and and so she's one of those. Uh, I don't know Christian Young. We have Rob Carter, that's Christ Creation Ministries International. He's been there for a long time. And he gave uh, what was probably one of the most anticipated talks at the Creation Research Society, which is reassessing human chimp similarity, which he's been uh, he's been having a back and forth on YouTube uh, with a number of other YouTubers who have been very critical of this human chimp 70% or 84% or, you know, there's different numbers that Young Earth Creationists throw around in terms of the percent similarity of the genome based on uh, Tompkins' work, uh, Dr. Tompkins from Institute for Creation Research. Uh, and he's been heavily criticized, Tompkins' work has been heavily criticized by uh, those outside Young Earth creationism. And that sort of shed light on some of his methods. And I know that Dr. Carter has spent a lot of time sort of trying to redo that analysis again uh, and sort of assess that work. And from, from what I hear from this particular talk and have seen on Facebook, um, he was, you know, as he said, a, this was going to be a really controversial talk because most he's going to actually criticize a lot of other young earth creationist methods in this. So I'm I'm assuming that he has found some faults with Tompkins, um, and then put his own you know spin on this in terms of how we should uh, interpret uh, chimp human similarity. Uh, but this is a big topic among young earth creationists because they constantly are are using that value from from Tompkins, and because of the criticism of Tompkins, it's been pretty strong. There's been a, a need within the Young Earth Creationist community to sort of address that criticism and to um, do some legitimate um, assessment of, of Tompkins' work to make sure that it's legit. And um, I'll be really interested to see what, uh, to, to be able to hear uh, Rob Carter's talk at some point. Um, we have some others that I don't know. And, and remember, I'm relatively familiar with most names in Young Earth Creationists and since I read the literature in all the different journals, uh, not except for Creation Research Society journal itself, right? I'm not up to date on the last maybe year and a half of that. Uh, and so 
a lot of these names, um, sometimes what they, if you're wondering, you're like, who are these people? Because they're not associated with uh, the big three, right? Institute for Creation Research, Creation Ministries International, um, uh, Answers in Genesis, right? They're not, they're not employees of those organizations. So who are these others? A lot of these are independent young earth creationists and independent in the sense that uh, maybe they're professors uh, in science departments at small Christian colleges that either are adhere to a young earth creationist um, viewpoint uh, or the college adheres to that viewpoint, or maybe they're just isolated individuals that, that adhere to a young earth creationist viewpoint. And maybe they're in small colleges and they need to have some kind of uh, contribution. They're working with undergraduates, so they're doing some kind of science. I mean, that's typical for most professors, even at small colleges, there's an expectation you do some kind of academic work. Uh, and so for a lot of, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking mostly not to young earth creationists here, but to those who are curious about how the young earth creationist um, world works. Um, those professors at those colleges like Bob Jones University or Liberty University or something like that, or Cedarville especially, um, who need to show some kind of like activity, you know, research activity that they're doing with students. Um, we'll take on some kind of project that involves, you know, creationism. And this would be a place then that they could come and give a talk or maybe they write a paper for the journal. Uh, so they're not typically going to be like super active young earth creationists in the sense that they're pumping out lots of stuff. They may only do one because they need one paper in order to get tenure or to get to continue their, get, you know, continue their contract uh, if they don't have tenure at their institution. Uh, and so I see a lot of this at some of these, some of these places in some of these journals, you see sort of one-off names, um, or maybe you see one or two articles, or, you know, they have a couple students that do a project and they get two or three articles out of it, but kind of never to be seen again. So this, um, I mean, this is not atypical of large scientific meetings either, where you have, you know, people that are, um, you know, trying to get into a field and maybe aren't successful and they give one talk at one meeting. Or they're at a small college, and that's all they need to do to again prove that they're prove their effort. All right, so sorry, taking a long time on this. Um, hope that was somewhat interesting. Uh, so we have keynote speaker Ken Ham uh, giving the Henry Morris Memorial Lecture, uh, and then again we've got some names that I don't know. Now, here's an interesting one right here, uh, 415 to 5, analysis of Middle Eastern genetic lineages through the Y chromosome. Uh, and I really was, what I, one thing I want to note about this list, I'll scroll down it, you can see names on here. There's only two names, I'm sorry, three names from Answers in Genesis, even though Answers in Genesis is right there, right? You know, so they have PhD scientists you know, who are working there, who didn't come and give talks at this co research conference, which is right there on their property. Um, I just don't understand the lack of their interest in engaging in this kind of uh, communication. Uh, and so I was very interested in this talk because this sounded very similar to uh, Nathaniel Jensen's work at Answers in Genesis. And uh, I did a lot of searching on Noah Nicholas, um, only discovered that I'm pretty sure, well, not absolutely sure, but I mean, I mean, to go out of limb here and say that it's a pseudonym. It's a pseudonym because I think it's a it's a name of a student at another college. Um, and I'll say I can't remember now whether I think that I can't remember if it was Bob Jones or whether it was Liberty. Um, and they're doing a project you know because i found evidence that there that there is a professor at one of those institutions that's doing a, a project with nathaniel jensen on y chromosome stuff and so i think this is a student of theirs that's probably presenting hey if somebody was at the creation research site which i know some of you out there who may watch this uh were there and heard that talk i'd love to hear like uh whether i was right about that i i don't you know i understand their desire to be anonymous um, in in their particular situation. So I'm kind of fine with that. Uh, but then I noticed this name, right? And it shows up twice. 
we've got Harry Sanders, right? This is Harry Sanders the third, or Harry Sanders the second, um, who has written the infamous series for Answers in Genesis uh, called The Young Earth Evolutionist. All right, and so here's Harry Sanders. Uh, I should probably explain that. Uh, Harry F. Sanders uh, wrote the first of a 13-part series for uh, Answers in Genesis called, you know, Calling Out the Dangers of Young Earth Evolutionists. Uh, he's written another other fairly, we'll call them caustic um, articles. Um, but his fingerprints are all over the vast majority of those articles. Uh, and so he's here. Uh, I presume writing, you know, as a representative from Answers in Genesis. Uh, and he's writing about uh, founder effect and post-flood dispersal and art kinds. Yeah, I'll be interested to see when that shows up on Answers in Genesis. Uh, and I'll probably we'll talk about that here. Uh, Nate Loper, he's like an independent young earth creationist that does Grand Canyon tours. Uh, although he's not talking about the Grand Canyon here. Um uh, Matthew Cesardi is, uh, I think, Creation Ministries International. John Barbgarner is uh, associated with the Logos Research Associates, and he's uh, also been associated with Institute for Creation Research. I can't remember if he's like on their, you know, on their list of people right now. Uh, and he's famous for catastrophic plate tectonics, so he's um, geology. And then we have Gabrielle, oh, I, I did miss one, Gabriella Hayes. So there were, sorry, there were four um, folks from Answers in Genesis. No, oh, sorry, let me, let me check that again. No, we have Harry F. Sanders, we have Gabriella Haynes. Sorry, uh, oh, and we have Danny Faulkner. All right, so yes, it's, it is three. All right, so we have Gabriella Haynes, and she's talking about, and she's the one that's been, she's the one that's been put in the very difficult seat, the hot seat at Answers in Genesis, given the task to push against birds being, you know, that there could ever have been a dinosaur that had feathers, right? All evidence of feathers on any organism has to be a bird, according to Answers in Genesis. Um, and so they have constantly just cannot stop writing articles. And most of them have Gabrielle Haynes behind. They talk about it on their show all the time, some fossil in that. So she has a talk, most Manoraptoran, all right, anatomy shows avian form. Manoraptorans include over raptors uh, and dromaeosaurs. All right. And a number of other things that probably had like four wings, like Wings on their legs, wings on feet, what kind of gliders, um, troodonts, um, all things that aren't considered in the main group of aviales, which are like the, the, all the modern birds, uh, considered cousins um, and dinosaur like, mini dinosaur like features, but also some bird like features. Um, but I want to point out that, uh, and so she's kind of trying to show that all of those have bird like anatomy and form and so in so I'm, I'm sure she's trying to like say in addition to having feathers they have these other characteristics of like birds so we can sort of like wrap it all up and say these are all birds you know this is the bird we can't say bird kind the bird group uh that includes many kinds of birds which include many kinds of birds that have many features like dinosaurs but they're actually birds created on the fifth day not the sixth day um uh, here's 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 why i bring this up I would, I'm going to be really interested to see what she says about the, the, the dromaeosaurs, all right, because that includes Velociraptor. Uh, and all those uh, answers in Genesis has written articles trying to deny that Velociraptor had any feathers. Uh, I don't know, maybe they've given up on that by now, but um, those would be in this group of Manoraptorans. Um, and so even if Gabrielle Haynes finally like lets that one slide into the bird category and puts Velociraptor in the bird category. There's also the Utah Raptor, right? Which is some kind of cousin of Velociraptor. It's just a really, really large version of Velociraptor, right? Large meaning like almost as tall as I am and 15 feet long. 
All right, a fairly heavy bodied thing, but has all the other features that a velociraptor has and likely has feathers, but definitely can't fly. Uh, and so, you know, is Answers in Genesis just going to start calling all these other dinosaurs just uh, flightless birds or something? I, is that is that where this is leading to? Like, you know, that God originally created all these other dinosaur-like type things, but they're not dinosaurs, they're birds, but they can't fly. So they're, what, like penguins? I mean, they're all created as flighted birds that can't fly, or they lost their flight? I, I don't, it's a very, very confusing thing that Answers in Genesis is doing, which I think many people in that room, <laughs> I know many people in that room watching this talk, uh, who are young earth creationists, probably very much disagree with this attempt to try to pull all these things together and call them all birds. But we move on. And then there is a second article um, by Harry F. Sanders, who also is on this, uh, you know, conniption about uh, the dino bird connection and just an insistence that we can't have dinosaurs that have feathers. We have to call them birds. Uh, and I presume that he's supporting that with this analysis of biochemistry of dinophos. Although I, I don't know what he means by analysis. Um, initial analysis of the apparently the the publications that are out there because I doubt he's doing biochemistry uh, himself. I don't, maybe I'm wrong, but it would be a completely new project uh, for him in a new area. Um. Anyway, that's the stuff that's here. My general remark is I only know like a third of the folks here. So either that's a good sign for young earth creationists. There's a lot of younger folks that are coming up and I don't know who these are. And that's a new generation of young earth creationists or um, these are one offs. Uh, like I said, individual faculty members who are submitting something. Uh, it's a little surprising. There's nobody. Mm, let me check again real quick. Well, Matt, you know, Baumgartner has been associated with ICR, but I, I, again, I don't think he is directly associated with them now. Uh, Michael Ord's kind of independent, maybe Creation Ministries International oriented. Uh, yeah, right. Institute for Creation Research is absent here. All right, at least in terms of the speaker list. Maybe there are some members of Institute for Creation Research here, but they chose not to speak. Uh, to me, that kind of speaks to, you know, they're not a big fan. They're, they're really, they're not big fans of uh, Answers in Genesis. And, you know, to come to the Ark Encounter is um, probably not terribly palatable. Uh, and there's also only a couple of what I would what I would call the young creationists. There's a couple of them here, but they are the, the young, young ones, all right? Not the ones that I think are the leaders of this sort of, I'll call, maybe I'll start calling them the new wave of young earth creationism. Um, and that also may have to do with the fact this is at the Ark Encounter, and the Ark Encounter has, which is answers in Genesis, has been very vocal about trying to uh, squelch all right, that new wave. Right? So there's a lot of interesting dynamics uh, going on in young earth creationism uh, right now. Um, and I'll also say I didn't find the titles of these talks like, ah, I have to know what they said about that. I know many of you are like, why would I care about that talk? But, you know, I find this stuff fascinating and I am interested in finding out what new ideas they have. And a lot of these are pretty, mm, you know, kind of a lot of side issues, not really super meaty stuff here. All right, let's move on. Spent too much time on this. All right, spent a lot of time on Creation Research uh, Society, but I always like to do a couple science stories. Um, so, let me just touch on a couple as, as quickly as I can. Uh, here's an article from Answers in Genesis. Variation and adaption in guppies and gambusia, right? Um, which are a similar, maybe, you know, for Answers in Genesis, probably the same kind of fish. 
Right. And just this whole article is a bunch of interesting facts about guppies and their shapes and sizes and their diversity. And there's, you know, there's like 300 different species, but they're all the same kind. So God created a kind of guppy and then they're allowed to, they've been enabled to radiate into lots of different environments on all kinds of different, different continents. All right. So what I wanted to point out here is I found this article intriguing for only one reason. And that is uh, I found it sounding kind of similar to some stuff coming out of Institute for Creation Research with their continuous environmental tracking and sort of the way they talk about uh, organisms and how they change and adapt. And you know, that's a big theme for me is like, where does biological diversity come from and the young earth creationist explanation for it. So I'll read just two little bits of this. Um, what about the barramen or the created kind of these organisms? Um, their purpose in creation is often associated with harmony, balance, and abundance. This is coming out of the theme of the rest of the article about what's the importance of guppies. Uh, it appears that this particular family was designed with an array of genes, alleles, and traits for rapid diversification, adaptation, and survival in a variety of environments and niches. Right, this is the same language that's used all the time in young earth creationism when you see a bunch of different kinds of felines living in different environments with different characteristics. You have large cats, you have small cats, desert cats, and ones that live in the jungles, right? They have lots of variation. So then how do you explain that variation if they were only two of them on the ark? Um, where did that variation come from? You know, this is the 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 trade words that are used. Um they were designed, you know, and then my question always is, what does design mean? Like, you know, what is, you know, what was there? Um, with an array of genes, alleles, and traits um, for rapid diversification, so they were designed to diversify, designed to change and adapt. Uh, and then you get this language. Now, this is the language actually from Institute for Creation Research. They were given by a master bioengineer, right? Randy Guglioso, the president of ICR, loves to talk about this engineering language that God is an engineer and he is using engineering principles to put into place, basically built into organisms, sensors that allow them to sense the environment and then make adjustments. But those adjustments all have to be pre-built in. All right, God had to put all those um I'll call them programs, right? Different alleles that could be used to adjust to the environment. And so it's sort of like, well, I, I sense this thing. And so I'm going to turn on some other different alleles and different combinations. That's going to give me these characteristics, which will fit me to that particular environment. Um, it's very much a, a different view than sort of the natural selection, uh, selecting on uh, populations and survival of some individuals and, and offspring. Um, yeah, so there's this master bioengineer who knew environments would change in the post-flood world, all right, and especially in the post-flood world. So God created guppies, but they lived in this tropical paradise, or at least um, this uh, pre-flood world that didn't have mountains and didn't have, uh, you know, icy zones, and I mean, basically, um, you know, similar habitats. And then after the flood, though, for one thing, they had to survive the flood. And then after the flood, they had to survive through salt water. So then after the flood, they they come along and then they're they're adapting to, you know, rivers in Norway and you know the tropics and like all these different locations with different, uh, very different conditions in terms of water quality uh, and other predators that would be in the water. And of course, there wouldn't have been predators, you know, before the fall. So. The master engineer um, put gave them genes and alleles and information, right, that they would only use like after the flood. So they had to divide and create new generations for probably for 1500 years between the fall and the flood. And so that could be, you know, 1500 generations of guppies. And then, uh, and they had to like pass that, all that code down right all those uh alleles and programs that they're not necessarily using um and so somehow they didn't lose those that information 
uh, that's the whole thing with genetic drift. How do they not lose it? How do they not break those things while they're just passing down and but not using them at all? Uh, in a in selective environment, we think about selection, maintaining what you're using. If you don't use it, you might lose it, right? Uh, anyway, after the flood, then suddenly the guppies are find themselves in new environments, and then they start using the bioengineered pieces that they were given in the original creation. Um, so once again, I'm just giving you examples of this type of approach to trying to explain biological diversity. This, this, this is, you know, I, I've been seeing this language sort of evolving over time in the creationist literature over the last 10 years, uh, and it's settling more and more and more on this type of language, which still doesn't really tell you how it happened, right? It's, it's very, in my mind, very hand wavy because if I sat down and looked at individual genes and individual alleles and asked how did they survive and how did they get chosen later, it's very murky to me because I have never seen a model for that uh, proposed by Young Earth Creationists. The master craftsman would give a preload of diversity to help them accommodate wherever is needed, though they might still struggle for survival in a fallen world, right? So the designer knew about the fall, gave them preloaded information so they could adapt but they would still struggle because of man's sin created an environment in which they have to struggle to survive. Um, but in that struggle, that's not the struggle that actually leads them to changes. I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's complex, right? I, I'm Every time I start thinking about this, it's, it's hard for me to even try to explain how young earth creationists, what they might thinking, because I'm not sure that they really think through this, <laughs> you know, the, the, the mechanisms itself. Um, I think someone would just said, well, we'll you know, we're, we're looking for those mechanisms. We're going to try to explain like, and come up with models for how this happens. Right now, all we have is this, God just put information in there and somehow it got used later. Uh, just reading on a little bit more in a fully designed yet changing world we can infer that these creatures creatures needs were anticipated by the master engineer for adaptation i'm stressing this because it's like god in the young earth creationist world is pre-prepared everything for even the year 2024 and and presumably if the environment changes still in the future which it will um, God has already installed programs and information in those organisms for maybe not being used until the year 2072, right? Maybe that's the year that a certain allele will finally be used in one of these one of these organisms in, in some particular place that God knew that that fish would be. As computer programmers preload software with information and computer language for the expanding needs of electronic devices, so too, a masterful mind has crafted DNA genes and other information for fish to undergo rapid diversification and adaptation, even speciation within a kind. You know, the guppy kind has genes for color, beauty, as well as survival and ongoing climate change, whether that be a great flood or warming trends on the planet. How about that? Do you see that language right there? That's really fascinating, actually, in an Answers in Genesis article. There's warming trends on the planet. Now, Answers in Genesis is going to say that that's not anthropogenically caused, right? But they, in this, at least these authors are saying, but it's undeniable that there's a warming trend and that's going to affect organisms. But don't worry, God knew about the warming trend and prepared the organisms for that warming trend. So they're, they're ready to go, right? They already have things that they can do to adapt to that warming trend. Um, yeah, but this whole thing of computer programmers preloading software, that, that's, that's sort of what these authors are envisioning, that God's uploading a bunch of stuff uh, into these organisms as he's making it, and then now they're going to just play out that software. Um, I, ca I can't help but say it. I, I, I'm criticized for saying this before, but I still need somebody to show me how that's not a deistic model. Uh, you know, that God is here to all this, and now... It just kind of like, okay, look, there's nothing new that needs to be done. You're just sort of like playing out the tape, right? 
Plovers. Mm, I love plovers. The reason I love plovers is because I'm a big fan of killdeer. Yeah, you, know, you follow a lot of killdeer. I've taken a lot of done a lot of photography of killdeer, and they're a, they're a type of plover. Um, but the golden plover, creation.com had an article uh, designed for energy conservation in flight. Now, what they were emphasizing in this particular article was the golden plover, which is one species of many dozens of species of plovers, and which is a type of shorebird. Um, this particular uh, plover uh, lives in um, the Arctic of North America. Uh, there's another very similar plover species uh, that's in Europe, right? And it migrates from northern Europe and Siberia and south uh, in the old world. And the golden plover is here in uh, Alaska, North America. And it's migrating south in North America. But there, but this particular species, a large population of this particular species, one of their migratory patterns is they they fly from, uh, I think it was Alaska or somewhere in Canada, and they fly to Hawaii. Right? That's a really, really long flight. Uh, there are some larger birds that can make this flight, but this is a pretty small bird. And so the, this whole article is, again, about it's about design. Right? It's about design because it's like, like, here's a bunch of stats. These birds, you know, they have to get, they have to gain a bunch of weight uh, in their Arctic environment, yeah, especially the babies, right? And oh, oh, by the way, here's a cute little uh, 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 hatchling here, uh, which shows really cool cryptic, you know, coloration. Uh, because what's being held in that hand there is that is some moss from the environment, and then that's the baby. Right, so they're very, they're these animals, well, plovers make their nest on the ground and they hide their eggs in plain sight and they hide their young in plain sight as well. Right, amazing um, ability to blend in with their environment. Um, so that's just a, a really cool feature of this particular plover. But this plover has to gain a certain amount of weight and then it has to fly to Hawaii and by the time it gets to Hawaii it's down to like you know the, the barely enough to stay alive any farther you know it's you can calculate it out it's like it couldn't go more than like another 100 or 200 miles without keeling over and they also fly in kind of a v-like formation so it's not just geese and larger birds I mean these are smaller birds but they still fly in this v-like formation which has been shown to conserve energy uh, as they swap out who's the leader and all that stuff all right so all of that is needed to, we can kind of think of it as like finely tuned for like, you know, it has to do all these things just to barely make it to Hawaii, right? And then to be able to make it back um, the next season. And so this in the mind of the person who writes the article is like obviously design. God, God made them this. I mean, because, I mean, this is just like, how could they possibly uh, have evolved this characteristic? Uh, they have to have been given these characteristics. Um, what's not mentioned anywhere in this article, and this is the reason I'm bringing this up, is because, um, sure, that, sure, you could make a what sounds like a compelling argument that God just must have made those characteristics exactly the way they are so that the plover could make it from that one place to another, right? Just like the coloration pattern here. They have to have certain alleles, right? Certain versions of genes. They have to turn on at just a certain time in development in order to create these, this green color because you can see that the adult doesn't have that same coloration pattern. Uh, and so this is a set of genes that has to be turned on and then turned off, right? And so all of those things have to be finely controlled uh, in the life cycle of a plover. Hmm, okay, so let's add one little bit of information here uh, that, that kind of mixes up the story, makes you think, and it goes right back to the previous story. I just told you there's, there's dozens of plovers, all right? Here's, here's another plover right here, all right? Killed here. And um, it's a different genus uh, in this case. Uh, there's several genera in this family. Um, this particular plover uh, flies down to like Florida and then uh, Mexico and even a little bit into uh, Central America. Uh, and then flies north all the way up into Canada, or in my case, stops in Ohio. Or actually stays in Ohio, comes to Ohio. This particular uh, 
Kildare right here, I believe has come back to this particular location at least three years in a row uh, because they've built a nest in the exact same spot. All right, three years in a row. Um, I don't have the genetic proof for the tagging to show that, but I know that that's been done on other ones. They come to the same location again if it was successful before. Uh, and so there's a, I don't know if you see it on the bottom right hand corner, but there's a nest there. Right, and there's uh, four eggs in this nest along this railroad track, so that shows how well hidden they are. Uh, and then here's here's this little baby plover, little baby uh, killdeer here. So this is one, and there's many others, and they each have their own characteristics, right? Um, they have their own sounds, they have their own calls, right? They eat slightly different foods. They're adapted to a bunch of different environments. Each one of these you could look at and say, wow, that is amazing, the adaptation in terms of the behaviors and how it raises its young. These birds, these killdeer, lay it in like gravel and waste areas. I've seen them in, in Colorado and in Wyoming and in uh, Tennessee and here in Ohio. Right, I can find them in similar locations. They're very similar birds in all those different locations, similar behaviors. They get the broken wing display where they try to distract you so you won't find their nest. They're like all that stuff, like really amazing behaviors. Whereas the 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 golden plover, I don't, you know, has different behaviors. Right. So if you're gonna use an argument that, you know, this is so amazingly fine-tuned that they could they would have the exact right traits to be able to make it to Hawaii, that long flight. But here you have dozens of other of the same kind of organism. And presumably there was only two of these animals on the ark. So after they got off the ark and then they had babies and then they had to become dozens and dozens of different species of plovers, each of which is somehow finely tuned to their different environment. Now we could go back to the language of the previous article and they, and the suggestion there might be that, well, the master planner, you know, gave them all these different alleles and all these different things. And that allowed them to then adapt and change. Um, but what I want to challenge young creationists to do is to create a genetic model for how you would do that in, a, in a, just a few generations. How do you adapt that? And how do you come up with the perfect combination, right, of alleles for that trip from Hawaii to, uh, to Alaska? Uh, how, how, do you, how do they do that? Right? Because the, the author makes it sound like this is just like God like, made them that way. But he didn't really make them that way. He made them like some other basic bird that might not have to migrate at all. Because remember, before the flood, there was only, according to Young Earth creationists, many of them, there was only one continent. They didn't need to fly a thousand miles. They, they had no need at the original creation to be able to fly for a thousand miles without ever landing. Right? They didn't have to have any special characteristics to, to know, like, I need to store up all this amount of food, and I need to fly in a V formation, I need to conserve X amount of energy in order to make it that many particular miles. Right? They, they were not challenged by that environment to do any of those things. That was only happened after the flood when then there was a Hawaii, which wasn't even really necessarily there ready to be lived on right after the flood anyway. It would have been like a naked island with no interest to birds to be there until it got populated by plants and so forth. So there's like, when did they learn how to, how to, how to do this? Um, and how did God separate the variation that was pre-front loaded into the original plover? How did he separate it through all these different mating events into separate packages in which, I mean, there's, there's a million, you know, killdeer today in North America right now. And, uh, really they're, they got slight variations between them, but I would dare you to just Find, you know, dare me to uh, show me the differences, right? I've seen killdeer in lots of places, and they act and behave just like the other killdeer that I know. Um, and so it's been sorted out into this package, um, and it's been that way for a long time. I mean, there's records of killdeers for thousands of years, right? It's not as simple as just 
there was a designer and then boom they were allowed to and then they adapted right you can't just say they adapted you got to have some way of explaining the mechanism for how they adapted see now i think what uh randy gulliuzzi at institute for creation research would say he used to say like continuous environmental tracking they had 10 offspring after they got off the ark and they flew in different directions well pairs i guess did males and females and when they landed in new environments um they then turned on different genes because they sensed they were in a different environment it's like well this substrate's different so i'm going to turn on these genes so i make eggs that have these speckles and some other bird landed somewhere else and they look at the environment they go like man my my eggs better be green because i'm in a green environment uh and so they turned on those genes all right not that there was selection on individuals that have those, but, but it was like they intentionally made green eggs. Now they had to have already had the information to do it because they don't believe that new information is created, right? So they have to say it occurred in the fall in the in the original creation and then was preserved all the way through the flood into individuals. And then the variation went out and then eventually it got turned on somewhere else. The whole point of all this is to say that, you know, evolutionary biologists have uh, a huge amount of experimental evidence um, showing how adaptation happens, how the genetics, right, the population genetics works out, uh, how different characteristics uh, come to be associated with different environments, and how long that would take to happen. If you have a population of hundreds of thousands of individuals. How do you get all the same genes in all those individuals? How many generations would it take for a particular allele to spread to all those different generations? You know, lots of genetic models that have been vetted and tested in real life situations. Um, that's something young know, creatures don't have anything other than there's a master designer and the variation somehow got sorted. The variation somehow was used to uh, adapt. Um, what's the mechanism? Is that, is there really, is there no mechanism? Is there no natural mechanism? Is it God, God just, uh, maybe supernaturally chose each of the variants for each organism as they divided and made offspring. And then he supernaturally designated that this bird would go to Hawaii because that's the one that has the variations that allow it to fly that far. Um, yeah, lots and lots of questions about mechanism are here. Uh, third, it's going to be a long episode. Intelligent designed flapping frequencies. So now we go to Institute for Creation Research. But what I'm doing here is Creation Ministries International, Answers in Genesis, and Institute for Creation Research. I'm showing you an article from all three, all three of which are invoking like design. Like this is so fine tuned. These characteristics are so perfect for their environment. This couldn't have happened by chance. Natural selection couldn't do this. God had to have made them this way. In all three of these cases, God didn't make the original animal with those characteristics necessarily. They had they changed over time, and eventually those are the characteristics they had in some future environment. Um, so there's a process involved in that. And what's the mechanism that then gets them to where they have the characteristics they have today? This was this actually is research based on a really cool article, um, which I I just realized I I forgotten where it was published. Um, I really should have shown you the, the original article for this, um, but there's an article that looks at uh, flapping frequency um, uh, with wing basically wing surface area, right? And, and the mass of the organism. So there's a relationship between the mass of like, you know, how big is the bird, how heavy it is and how big its wings are. Um, but then also with how frequently they flap their wings, right? If you're big and heavy and you have small wings, you're gonna have to flap them really fast, right? Uh, if you're light and you have big wings, you don't have to flap them as much. Uh, so there's gonna be, you might expect there could be some ratio there. You think of engineering principles here, really do really do apply here. Uh, and sure enough, you look at organisms, everything from insects to birds to bats to penguins, which are like flying under the water, right? They have wings and they're pushing themselves through the water. Uh, and whales, right? And you look at those and you look at this ratio of mass wing area, mass to wing area, 
compared that to beat frequency. And it falls amazingly on this line, right? And so there is this, this, uh, this, this, this very close relationship between these features. And uh, this article is basically saying, well, that's, that's intelligent design. That's proof right there, right? All of these things are, have the same efficiency. And therefore, like, how could chance create efficiency like that? Of course, natural selection is not the process of natural selection and, and uh, mutations creating variation is, you know, the selection part of that is not chance. And if you had thousands of individuals in a population, each of which had slightly different frequencies of beating their wings because of their genes and their alleles, and some of them were more efficient than others, they're the ones that are going to survive better and they're going to have offspring and they're going to share their genes. So you would expect actually natural selection would predict that over time, each organism, if it wants to change its mass, right, get larger, it has to adjust its wing size and its beat frequency to get to the most efficient point. And what we're seeing here is the most efficient point. It's saying that all populations of things that have wings eventually, or you could say through time, maintain this relationship. As the organism changes its characteristics, it has to maintain this balance. So for every mutation that creates a size change in the total mass, they have to have a mutation that maybe changes the, the size of the wing, the surface area of the wing, or maybe it has to slow the wings down or speed the wing up in terms of beat frequency. Right? That's, that, that is just, that's what's going to happen with any natural population that is being selected for the most efficient organisms in that particular environment under those particular conditions. Um, so this is like a wonderful example of an expectation from natural selection acting on populations over time. All righty. Um, Oh, let's not belabor this one. Really simple. Answers in Genesis. Ken Ham, actually, whoever writes for Ken Ham, probably Harry of Sanders. Um, does glacier algae contradict evolution's rules? He's just responding to an article that was in the news, and um, and this is how he starts by referencing it. Evolution is generally considered a march of progress as creatures supposedly become more complex over time. All right, so that's his misconception of evolution. And then of course he finds this article that shows that there's a purple algae that lives in a really extreme environment that contradicts this idea. How does it contradict this idea? It's a purple algae that used to be a clonal organism, or at least its relatives are, and it has reduced itself down to a single celled version and simplified. In fact, its genome has actually been reduced in size. Uh, and so it's super common in the Arctic as very, very successful organism. Um, but in Ken Ham's mind, it's simpler than what its presumed ancestor was. Yeah, its ancestor was a larger, more complex organism that then became simpler in order to conquer this new environment of the Arctic. Uh, and to him, that is an evolution that contradicts evolution because in his mind, evolution is always this progress up. Like all organisms get larger. That's why he always shows dogs getting smaller as being opposite of evolution. Um, you know, and that genomes have to get bigger and that organisms have to go from multicellular or single cells to multi cells. Like only that can happen to call it evolution. Everything else is anti evolution. This is such a simple misconception that he perpetuates over and over and over and over again. I think in his mind, I, I don't think he's lying because I think that he just doesn't understand uh, and he doesn't want to understand. He knows this works. The story works really well, right? It's simple to plug and play. Oh, look, there's a, but yeah, there's lots of organisms. I mean, he has examples of them in his arc, you know, like ostriches that were that were created as flying organisms, and now they've lost the ability to fly. They've simplified that part of their life. Um, but of course, in his mind, that's degradation. That's not evolution. That's loss of features. Um, but lots of organisms, 
it's better to lose a character and live better in your environment than it is to carry around a bunch of baggage and stuff you don't need. Right? If losing parts helps you be more efficient, then that's what you're going to do. Right? There's no direction to thou shalt or must make this type of change. It's about what is best for the organism at that moment in time in that particular environment. All right, this is just a pitch for another um, video I made recently. Um, animal kinds buried alongside their dinosaurs, um, alongside the dinosaurs. This is just a slide from an Answers in Genesis talk given at the Creation Museum or Ark Encounter. Uh, and it really got to me because I've heard this particular talk many times. Uh, and I know that Answers in Genesis, some people there know that what they're saying is not correct. Yet they still let their speakers trot out there and read the script um, and, and tell what I'm saying are lies. And I don't use the word lie very often. Um, but in this case, when you've been shown something to be inaccurate and you knowingly continue to persist to say the same thing in order to get the audience to believe something that's not true, it does, I just don't know what other word to use for that. And uh, go watch the video, but the, the, the short version of this is, you know, they talk about how evolutionists are lying to you because there's lots of modern animals that have been, modern mammals that have been found with dinosaurs. And then they list off of some, like there's a rabbit and there's a, a beaver and then there's a, a squirrel, right? Um, and all these animals and, and even a plover, right? All these animals have been found with dinosaurs. And specifically, they talk about a beaver. There's no beaver that's ever been found with dinosaurs. Nothing in the beaver kind. There's something that's called the Jurassic beaver in the literature. It's not a beaver. It's not. They know that. They know it's not a beaver. It has a beaver-like tail. It's an organism with a beaver-like tail, but it doesn't have beaver-like teeth. It doesn't have a, a rest of the anatomy. It's not beaver-like. It's been assigned to a completely different family. Not even in, no evolutionist even thinks it's even closely related at all to the beaver family. And yet, so that means beavers have not been shown to live, have lived with the dinosaurs. Uh, and yet, Anches and Genesis speakers continue to talk about, oh, and beavers have been found with dinosaurs. It sounds like a simple little mistake, but it's been 16 years ago that they made that mistake by not reading the original literature. And they have persistently repeated that error over and over and over again, despite multiple people pointing it out to them and answers in uh, speak. Well, there is a member of answers in Genesis that has even written that they've been told that this is incorrect and they refuse to change what they've said. And they continue to call this a beaver with no rationale, no explanation, no, like, you know, the, the, you know, that you're wrong it's simply wish to ignore that advice. That's why I call it a lie. All right, that's it. This week in creationism, a lot of stuff going on. I have a bunch of other things to talk about, but I'm parsing them out into separate uh, videos. Um, and yeah, I just, I'll have a bunch of reflections toward the end of the summer of, of some things that have happened uh, this past summer and things that have really gotten me think some new ways about creationism and this whole creation evolution debate and stuff within the church. Right. Until then, thanks for listening. Subscribe, like, you know, do those things. Appreciate it. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.